I, I wanted to talk about a little before we started the, the rest of the class. Um, uh, a minute ago, tick, uh, well, more than a minute ago, uh, a little earlier, Tixie and I were talking about uh, uh, stereotypes in, in, uh, in, in Western countries, in, in particular. He lived in Canada. Uh, I, we, we live in the United States. Um, there, if you, if you live in a country where most everybody looks like you, you have an understanding that people outside of Ethiopia have a view of you that, that is probably inaccurate. But every day we live with people who have these views of us that sometimes are really outdated and, and deliberately inaccurate and they often hold on to them. So back in, in the early days of American theater and American movie making, they would have these actors um, who, would, who would play the black roles because they didn't want any black actors. They did not want to hire black actors. So they would have white actors play black characters and they would paint their faces black. And they usually left, left their lips white and that, the space around their eyes. Um, so it became sort of this really negative stereotype about black people. And, and very often they would exaggerate the size of our lips and, and, and other kinds of features. So they started to, cry, okay, they started to find their way into, into print media and, and cartoonists would draw these, these images with you know, this black skin and white lips and bulging eyes. And it was this negative stereotype about black people. And so over the years, what we've tried to do, what all of us who were here as trainers have been trying to do is, is fight negative stereotypes. This, this stereotype has to be really old. And I wasn't quite aware that there was anyone in America who did not know that it was a negative stereotype, except last Friday, this cartoon appeared on the front page of a student newspaper at the State University of New York at Plattsburgh. Plattsburgh is a, is a town up that, that's um, north, far north of New York City. Um, probably about 300 miles north of New York City, up near the Canadian border. And this, the, the interesting thing about it is that the, this, this illustration goes with the story about diversity. So I posted this on Facebook, and I, I, it, just sort of musing about who in the 21st century does not understand that this is a, a, a racist stereotype of an image. And so part of the challenge for us, and, which, and, and why I wanted to mention it, is part of the challenge for you is that there will be battles that you will think you have won in terms of the image you're trying to create about yourself and about your country and about your continent. And you will think, we've moved beyond that, only to see something like this crop up. You know, because people hold on to old images. And the interesting thing is, and, 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 and Ruddy and I were talking about this in the car on the way over here, people keep asking me, is it hot? How hot is it? And I'm saying, it's not hot at all. And I've, I can't tell how many people I've ad, had ask me about elephants and lions and things like that. And it's like, no, no, that's not Ethiopia. That's other parts of Africa. So, so people, people don't try very often to challenge their stereotypes. And, and sometimes when you think you've overcome them, people will reach back and get old things like this, maybe sometimes somewhat naively, but it, it, it's interesting that they use this to, to uh, illustrate um, a story about diversity. And I just wanted to bring it to your attention because I think it says a lot about the kinds of challenges that you will be up against, that when you feel like you have made progress, changing the images that people have about, about you, your people, your families, your country, your continent, that you will see that old images will continue to crop back up. Old stereotypes will, will continue to, to, uh, to, to be very difficult to get rid of. Can I add a thought? Please. So I, I didn't see this image until we arrived here, until Robert arrived here just now. And one thing that I see in this is, so I can just see beneath the photograph, part of the headline. And so I know that Robert said that this is a story about diversity, but I can see that this says minority admission rates. And then I don't know what the next word is, right? 
And so let's just say the story is about minority admission rates. And so what that means is the school is predominantly white, and this is a conversation about how many black, Latino, maybe Asian, and maybe, maybe um, the indigenous people to America, how many of those people are getting admitted? What percentage of the school population is these groups, which we call people of color in the United States? And so the, the illustration is really interesting to me because not only is it this um, black face stereotype with the, you know, the dark skin and the big eyes and the Teeth, you know, the shiny teeth, and some of those images back in the day used to have somebody eating a watermelon, which is a, a fruit that is stereotypically associated with us. Maybe sitting in a watermelon patch barefoot eating a watermelon. Um, so they have that image, but look at their, um, look at how they're depicting a black student com who's coming in. So their assumption is that the person is poor. You see the um, car on blocks, you see broken windows, you see falling down things. And so that's who they think Boarded we are. Boarded up windows and Boarded doors. up windows, yeah. That's who they think we are. Now, the fact of the matter is there are people who have this experience, but this is not everybody. And, um, but this is where their mind goes, where they think of us, and part of the reason their mind goes there when they think of us is because of what the media has taught them about us. Um, I was doing some research recently and learned that in the United States, only um, 60% of white people live in, a, live in a county that is less than 5% black. So most of the United States has no firsthand experience with black people. They learn about us on television or through the media. And so this is what they come up with. That's who they think they are. That's who they think we are. Um, so tell me a little bit about your story. What, tell me about your story idea. What are you thinking about? Well, I want to write about the education system in Ethiopia. I believe that the education system in Ethiopia can solve most of our problems huh. that we are facing in our country. And uh, it is the education system in our country now is based on theoretical than practical mm -hmm. things. And I believe that uh, it, will, it doesn't help people to rationalize their situation and to question their environment. And but can I ask, when you use the word rationalize, what do you mean? It doesn't help people to rationalize their situation. Uh, what I want to say about that is, uh, for example, you were born poor. Uh -huh. Then they will think that that is what they are. And uh, they cannot go beyond that. Okay. They don't rationalize and they don't, it doesn't help them because it's most, mostly based on theory-based theory and uh -huh. theory-practical. Mm -hmm. so, so, um, so say this, theory or theoretical? Theoretical? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So theoretical-based? Yes. So uh, it, when I t if I want to tell you about what happens to an individual in Ethiopia after he completes 12th grade, He's forced to join a field that he doesn't want to join, or a, oh. yeah, a field that you don't want to study. They force you. The government forces you to do that. To I think to balance the people and the fields. Oh. Yeah. So this creates more people who are who don't want to do, who are not happy doing what they are doing. Mm -hmm. So it forces people to uh, in, into some direction, depression, and we are not learning in our, <clears throat> our early age that we have to, like uh, in the past, in the past we were, uh, we used to learn this ethics and gardening, painting, music, woodwork, home economics, this kind of things. Uh, I have seen most films in American films that kids like 16 years old, eight years old, they know what they want to do because, and they know about this small, small detail. They know about photography, they know about music a little bit, uh -huh. and they learn about other languages, French, something like that. And, and in the movies they do. 
Yeah. <laughs> in real life, I think it's a little bit different than that. But it may be true that they have more exposure yes. to some things, yes. especially a middle class child or an affluent child is going to have a lot more exposure than a poor child. Yeah. But And it may also be true that a low income child in the United States is exposed to more of those things, maybe, I'm not sure, than someplace in the developing world. Yeah, but what I want to say is they, will, they are given the opportunity to identify what they want to do in life. Maybe. Yeah. In the movies okay. they are. In the movies. And in the TV shows. <laughs> uh -huh. or, uh, and they have the opportunity to practice that mm -hmm. in an early age, mm -hmm. which our educational system is not allowing us to do. Mm -hmm. So I want to write about that. Okay, good. So, so I just want to acknowledge that you do have the perception that that's how the American educational system operates based on what the images that have been projected from the United States to you. Yes. So I understand that you have that projection. And I also want to say that that's true for some children, but it's very untrue for a lot of children. So, so that is the general idea that you want to explore. Yeah. Right. For example, uh, if we talk about music, you can see Chris Brown, 16 years old, he was really famous, he knew what he wanted to do. He practiced yes. what he wanted to do at an early age. Yes. So those kinds of things yeah. in, in our country, if you come to our country, we are not able to explore. Okay, okay, so okay. I want to write about this educational system which is affecting most of the community who's going through this. Okay, good. So this is the broad idea that you want to explore. Yeah. Okay, so whose eyes do you want to explore it through? Or how, how do you want to approach it? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I thought... Or, or, or we could approach it from another angle. Mm -hmm. It could be, who do you want your reader to be? That might be another way to get it. To get yeah, that. I want it. I want my writing to be a revolution. I mean, it's not a new idea, but at the same time, I want to focus. Even though it's happening, it's uh, affecting everybody, both male and female. Mm -hmm. I want to focus on women mm -hmm. because there are also social challenges. Your mom, your dad will tell you to get a job, to go to universities, to get a job, and to start your life, to survive. Mm -hmm. That is what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. That is what they want to see. Mm -hmm. So you are not uh, encouraged to explore other opportunities. Plus, you don't have the chance and you don't know because this educational system didn't allow you to, to do yeah. that. Yeah. And your family also doesn't know about this because it's not in the educational system. The educational system tells you you have to go to university, you have to get a job and yeah. get your degree, yeah. those kind of things. Yes. Okay, all right, good. So if I'm understanding you correctly, the who in your story is women, young yeah. women who have graduated high school and who are being, no, they don't have a choice. They're, they're being placed in, no, graduated high school and college and are placed in yeah. a career? It could be, we can see it from, three different angles. For example, a woman who is 12th grade and who is going to be forced mm -hmm. to join some field that she doesn't want to join. Mm -hmm. Or we can see it from uh, a university student who is still learning because, I mean, she, she has a choice to change it. She has a choice to raise her voice and say, I don't want to do this, I want to do that. So, and other women who have a job who, but they are not satisfied, mm -hmm. who are not happy. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, good. So let me make sure I understand something. So a woman who's in college, mm -hmm. is she forced onto a certain career track based or strongly encouraged to follow a certain career based upon the jobs that are that the country needs yeah. her to fill? Kind okay. Of, yes. Okay. And so when you say she could rebel or she could she has choice, choice to do what? I I in my opinion, I believe that everybody has a choice to okay. choose whatever they want to okay. do. Okay. Whatever they want to do. Okay. 
that is what I, I, I meant. Even though there's a situation, your response to that situation will change it's the outcome. Choice. Okay. Yeah. So I believe that's powerful. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so okay. I believe like that. Okay. So our who? It sounds like maybe the way you want to tell this story, you want to tell the story through the eyes of three who's. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. One okay. would be a high school educated woman mm -hmm. who has to follow a certain career path because certain <laughs> jobs are needed in the economy. Yes. Another would be a woman who's in college or is college educated who is being steered a certain way but might still have choice. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. And then the third would be a woman who already is in a career that might not have been her first choice mm -hmm. and she's not enjoying it. Yes. Okay. All right. I like this. Okay. Um, and it's complex. Okay. Yes. Good. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. We can do complicated. All right. Um, so you have three who's. And so the what you want to explore is what? Because it's a big subject. So you want to, let's hone in on what. What I want to explore, what I want to tell yes. through this is I'm, as an individual, as a person in this country, I'm worried if we keep creating this kind of people, if this educational system is creating this kind of people, and then we'll end up with the same Ethiopia after 20 years. Oh. I'm so sure of it because, you know, people here will understand me because uh, when you do what you really like to do, mm -hmm. it's like flying. It's like you are aligned with your purpose and everything is coming right. I love her. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. So that is what. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. And so our where would be, how do we want to think about our where? Where? Where are these women? So we have Absolutely. one where already. So our one where is kind of where they are situated in, in life. So high school, college, or already in a career and not happy with it, right? Yeah. So that's one where. But do we have a geographic where or? Um. There are a lot of universities around in this country, in different areas of this country, but I I have to I have to analyze some facts. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are some things that I don't know. Yeah. Because I don't know uh, which university is affected by it, but mm -hmm. there are a lot of different angles I can see this from. Uh, there are people who live in Addis in Addis Ababa, here in the capital city, maybe those people are more exposed to uh, okay. the information. Yeah, that would make sense. And they, I think they have the small, small opportunities to identify what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of things here. So maybe I can see it from people who are living outside Addis. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so we have our who, we have our what, we have our where, we have a, a, a couple of, a, a few who's, we have our what, we have a couple of where's. Um, so when, let's explore when a little bit. When I want to do this. Yeah, when will you be able to do this piece? <clears throat> also, let's talk about, um, so when, um, when this will be set in time. Um, so in terms of setting in time, we're kind of talking about now. Right? Yes. Yeah. No. Yeah. And when would you um, be able to do the research for this piece? Or when would you imagine being able to complete this piece? Well, um, I think finding the right subject will, will take some time. So, and I have to go out of this. I live here. so. <laughs> one year to really analyze the, the situation and different angles because Robert, Mr. Robert told us that we have to see everything from every uh, different angles, yes. different perspectives. So, so you that. need some time to do that. Yeah, one year will be okay, I guess. Okay, okay. Um, so let's explore why a little bit. Um, what is your why behind wanting to write this story? And then I also want to ask you, why would somebody want to read it? 
what's in it for them? What, what would they get out of it? What would you like them to get out of it? Like I told you before, uh, I want to write this piece because when I, when I think about when I think about the future of our country, I'm thinking, see, if you want to achieve something in the future, then you have to work every step now, right? And I, we are going the same direction. We're not changing any perspective. We are creating people who don't like what they want to do or who are forced to like, like it and get depressed when they get home. So I don't think those people would give us the 100 person that we want yeah. in every field. Mm -hmm. So that is why I want to write. I, I want to write this piece because I want to create a revolution or uh -huh. I want to wake someone up. Yeah. It's not something that nobody knows about. Everybody knows about it, but it's not we don't hear it yeah. that much in the media. Not that much, we don't hear it in the media. Mm -hmm. So that is why I want to write about this. I want, at least by this, someone will wake up. Ah, and that's be beautiful. With me. Okay, good, that's beautiful. And um, so what's in it for me? Like, why would I read this story? If you are an Ethiopian. If I'm an Ethiopian. Mm -hmm. When, Whether I'm a high school, I'm a woman, I'm an Ethiopian woman. You all keep telling me I'm Ethiopian, right? <laughs> so I'm an Ethiopian woman, and let's say I'm in my career and I don't like my job. Why would I, why would I want to read about this? That's depressing. I can't do anything about it. Yes. What do you, why would I read it? Uh, I had the chance to face different people and in different circumstances, like the, when some motivational speaker is coming, or uh, when some motivational thing is happening, most of the people are like, yeah, I want, I, want, I want this, I will do this, something like that. So I believe that my people will wake up reading this. They want to hear it because they have never heard it. And this is, I believe that this is their question also. So this is a question for the government or for the people themselves. Mm -hmm. They have to ask themselves mm -hmm. what they are doing. Uh -huh. Because you have given a chance, you have given everything. It's not, you don't have to go to America or you don't have to go to anywhere else. You are here, God gave you everything and what are you doing? That is what I wanna mm. say. <laughs> mm. That's beautiful, yeah. that's beautiful. And um, so how are we gonna get this done? Me and you. Oh, me and you? <laughs> oh, am I doing how the research or the writing? How <laughs> are we? How are, you, how are you gonna get it done? Yeah, how am I gonna get this done? So I'm thinking I have to find the right subject, as I told you before, because I don't want anybody to complain I just want someone who is aware of the situation in the first place, mm -hmm. because they will have that perspective. They will tell you angles, different angles that you should go to. So I, I think I have to research a bit, mm -hmm. uh, because I also don't know. I, I I only talk about what I'm feeling or what the what I think the people are feeling. Mm -hmm. I don't talk about the government. What is the why is the government doing this in the mm -hmm. first place? Ah. Yeah, they should have thought about my idea, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not the only one thinking it. Mm -hmm. So, I have to explore different uh, angles and different subjects. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that is, I have to research first mm -hmm. on those subjects. Mm -hmm. Then I will decide mm -hmm. what I will do. Okay, so first you need to research yeah. and identify your subjects. You'll need three subjects. Yes. And I can't remember, did we say all three are outside of Addis or one in Addis and two out? All three out? All three out. Okay. Because I believe People in Addis are also facing the same problem, mm -hmm. but I believe that they have the opportunity if they work, if they analyze uh -huh. somehow. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Somehow, I, I believe. 
Okay. They have the opportunity. Okay. So let's so, just think about the logistics of um, identifying these three people. Like, how might you go about it? Identifying these people. Yeah. There's this, uh, there will always be this person who is, uh, for example, in Ghana University, I used to remember that uh, there's this one girl who's strong, who's the student representative. Mm -hmm. Those kind of girls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, even even though you're strong, you may be forced to do things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. People will talk about you because I will. I, I'm so sure if I start this, I will find those people. But I'm looking for strong people. Mm -hmm. I can go to their teachers, ask mm -hmm. who these people are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can find those people through people that, that know them. Okay, you can network or you can identify leaders, yeah. student leaders at universities or that kind of thing. Okay, that's fine. And um, so how would you go about identifying who from the government you would want to talk to about why this is the government's approach? <laughs> from the government. So, <laughs> so uh, there's an education minister, right? Yes. So, <laughs> I will, they will give you information, actually. The information, the, infor the education minister or, the, yeah. or their office will give you information yeah. about why they do Yeah, what because they do. like I told you, in the past we had this uh, educational system where you, ha you will, kids will learn painting, mm -hmm. music, and it will broaden your horizon, and you will think different things, and you'll find yourself somewhere. Mm -hmm. So those things are no longer there. Okay. I want to know why they are okay. no longer there. Okay, okay. So you'll interview somebody or somebody's at the education ministry? Yes. Okay. Um, who else might you want to interview? Mm. Coming here, I have seen, uh, I have seen different people who, are, who love what they do, who are committed to it. Yeah. Those kind of perspectives, I think they can help me. Okay. Because, okay. Uh, See, nobody knows how it feels mm -hmm. to do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Most of the people in the world don't know that. Not only in my country, but in the world. Mm -hmm. So interviewing that kind of person might help me enlighten, mm -hmm. or it might be some spice. It will add some spice to the writing. Yeah, from somebody who does something they love. Yeah. Right? Or some people who do what mm -hmm. they love. Yeah. And I was going to ask you another question that just, oh, how about any experts? Do you think there might be any research on this or any university experts or perhaps any psychologists to yeah. talk about the, how it affects your mental health to? I think just, if I do that, it will take more than a year. Okay. <laughs> okay. But I, I really like that um, because I'm just a human being, mm -hmm. seeing things through my eyes and mm -hmm. through what I have experienced in life. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what they are going to tell me, yeah. why people are acting like that. It may be not, they, they will tell me my hypothesis is not right, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking this, if this educational system is continuing like this, then we are creating people who don't love what they want to do and we are going to stay the same. That is my hypothesis. So people would tell me, maybe the psychiatrist might tell me that you are wrong. This is not mm -hmm. why this is happening, mm -hmm. maybe. So I really like to include it. If you give me the money to do it. Oh, if I give you the money. Why do you need <laughs> money to interview a psychiatrist? No, I have to go out of the country, right? You have to go to, out of the country? Yeah. Why? Because I told you that I have to find people yeah. who are forced to join. Uh huh. So you universes. need. Uh huh. So you need. You're asking for financial support to find these three people in the outlying provinces. Hmm. Okay. So say I say yes. What? Would, how much would you ask for? 
how much. It depends on the location of the universities, mm -hmm. right? It well, depends. as your editor, I want you to find somebody close because I don't want to give you a lot of money. Yeah, as a woman, <laughs> ma'am, <laughs> as a woman, uh, this story also means something to you, right? Yes, it does. But there are women everywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. There are women everywhere. But I, but I'm thinking this is, this will generate a lot of money for you because we haven't heard these voices, mm -hmm. what I'm going to bring to you. Mm -hmm. And we haven't seen this perspective in any newspaper or in any magazine or online website. Well, let me ask you this. Do you know how to operate a camera? Yes. Do you know how to operate a video camera? Yes. Because the only way I see that maybe you could bring me some additional money mm -hmm. might be if this were a multimedia project. I'm so glad you said that because I'm thinking to do this as a documentary. Oh. Somehow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I might be willing to talk about if you were to interview these three women or maybe it could be more than three women if we do a multimedia project, mm -hmm. if you could do little shorts a few minutes long, asking the women about their experience, how it feels. Would women be willing to do that on camera? Yes, I think strong women would do that. On camera? Yes. Okay. This, this doesn't, uh, I believe that this doesn't affect any, any, any part of their life, mm -hmm. but if they're not willing to do it, then I will give them that opportunity mm -hmm. not so, to identify mm -hmm. mm -hmm. them. And um, you can also take photographs as well? Yeah. Okay, so you could take photographs for the, to accompany the piece in the newspaper or, yes. or the magazine? Mm -hmm. Okay. And let me ask you this, um, stepping out of role a little bit, as somebody who's not from Ethiopia, <coughs> And um, I know you're asking a difficult question about how the government um, behaves. What are the chances that people will feel afraid to talk about or uncomfortable talking about this? Yeah, people might be, might be. Yeah. So, so I, I, I can use my photography to, without identifying someone, you can photograph someone without identifying what, I don't know, I, you can, I think you can use your art to express that without identifying that person. Mm -hmm. I think there's a chance to do that. Well, does that mean you would want to use anonymous sources in the story? If people are not happy to mm -hmm. identify themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure I really like that idea about using anonymous sources in the story. Mm -hmm. So I would want you to find real people who would be willing to talk about how they feel. And have we worked together before? Yes. We've worked together before. So I know you and I trust you. Yes. Okay. Um, still, I have a budget and I have to manage my budget. So I would want you to f find women not in the far provinces, okay. like closer mm -hmm. to Addis. Maybe not in Addis so they wouldn't have had the same degree of exposure, okay. but not far, right? Okay. Okay. All right, good. And um, how long do you envision this piece to be? I want, I want it to be a long piece, if that's what's, what you're asking. Mm -hmm. I want it to be a long piece. Mm -hmm. um, so just to give you some context, so you said that Ethiopian schools don't have math and art and music and that kind of thing anymore? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, not math, music and art and, and that kind of stuff. In many, many American schools, those programs don't exist as well. So in almost any big city in the United States, there are very few schools that have music, art, what else did you say? Painting, yeah. yeah, that's rare. Who gets that is more private schools where richer kids go and maybe some suburban schools where people are more affluent. Those children still get that education. I live in Philadelphia, which is the fifth largest city in the United States. It's a poor city, it's a working class city. Um, people are either working class or, or kind of um, affluent. And so the affluent people, their children, the affluent people fight for their children to get that in their schools, even if they're public schools. Mm -hmm. The affluent people will pay their own money, they'll hire their own teachers, even if the government 
doesn't have those teachers or don't, doesn't have those opportunities in the school. The people will fund it themselves. Um, but in Philadelphia, <coughs> there I think there are, I think this is this is very close to accurate. I think there are 273 schools in Philadelphia, and out of those 273 schools, there are only 13 libraries in schools. It used to be that every school had a library in it. And so we have a question, I have the question, how do you raise people who are literate and who can read if you have them <coughs> in schools where there are no books and there are no libraries? So some of this, to the point that Robert's making, is the American fairy tale that we export around the world. Um, there are hardly no Chris Browns. Still, yours is a very valid story. But we have the same thing in our country. There, just like Robert said, there are a gazillion, particularly African-American boys, who are trying to be Chris Brown, right? Mm. And they're singing and dancing and rapping for hours and hours and hours. Some of them are doing this when they could be studying. So they're doing that in place of studying. The studying is actually the thing that will get them ahead, even though many of them are in lousy school systems. The chances of them being the next Chris Brown are like next to nothing. And I think her story is really timely, too, because among your kind of, we call it your age group, most, most of you guys millennials, right? In your age group, there is a very active dialogue among people who are trying to escape the cubicle, they call it, right? Their little small office where they go with the little walls around them, and they don't like what they do. So there's a very active conversation in our, in our country around trying, how do we connect with work that really inspires us? Yeah. So one of, the, one of the debates that's raging in the United States recently is about the whole, which you probably heard about, the whole Black Lives Matter movement, where a lot of, a, a lot of African American men have been killed by police officers. And women. And women, too, yes. Um, although it's another part of their story, because. Uh, yes. But but some other people too. But um, yes. Uh, but 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 so so the FBI directed some some police chiefs have complained and some police unions have complained that 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 there is this backlash against against uh, against police officers and that there is an escalation of violence against police officers as a result of that. There's nothing to back it up. They're just saying it. And they are, no one seemed to be differentiating uh, their, uh, whether there's, there's the violence is coming from black people or, or white people or whether the, the, even the black men who may have committed crimes against, against police officers had, cared anything about what happened in those streets. They, so there, there's, there, there, there's this association. So anyway, so there, there was a big police conference in Chicago. President Obama was speaking there. And, and uh, the, the, uh, the FBI director, who, who ultimately reports to the president. Do you want to say what the FBI is? I was going to just say, does everybody know what the FBI is? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah they know what the FBI okay. is. Okay, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> they know what the FBI is. So the FBI director said, is saying that there's that what, what he, that everybody's calling the Ferguson effect. So if you saw on the news, there, were, there was rioting in Ferguson, Missouri a fairly small town in Missouri, after this police officer killed this 19-year-old, this, uh, 19 19-year-old, 19 and they let, they let him lie, lie dead in the streets for the longest time. Um, and and, and so, uh, so the police officer, they, they did not, in the American system, they, 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 the system works as so if you commit a crime, the, you get arrested, and then they indict you. What basically... A grand jury decides whether there is sufficient evidence to actually bring you to trial. So the grand jury said there was not. So they did not indict the police officer, and he went free. So, so uh, that's basically what this story is about. And so, so we'll go through it a little and, de and sort of deconstruct it. Um, President Obama said Tuesday that there is no evidence police officers in major cities have pulled back from enforcing the law out of concern they will come under fire from hard, using harsh tactics. That, that's what? That's what part of our story is that? That's the lead. And we talked about different kinds of lead. This is a summary lead. It just takes the story and, and in, a, in, a, in, in a small bit of information just tells us what the story is about. It summarizes the story. Okay. Twice in the past week, FBI Director James V. Comey 
suggested that exactly such a phenomenon was responsible for rising crime rates in many U.S. cities, as police officers worried that their behavior on video will go viral. <laughs> yeah, a chill wind has blown through law enforcement over the last year, and that wind is surely changing behavior, Comey said Friday. But speaking here Tuesday to the International Association of Chiefs of Police, Obama said, it is true that in some cities, including here in my hometown of Chicago, gun violence and homicides have spiked. And in some cases, they spiked significantly. But the fact is that so far, at least across the nation, the data shows that we are still enjoying historically low rates of violent crime. I would suggest that that is our nut graph because it tells us in a nutshell what the story is about. Now here's the other thing. So, so we talked about supporting the lead. So we start to pick up facts. So Comey acknowledged that there's only anecdotal evidence that some cities are experiencing what some have called the Ferguson effect, a reference to last year's police shooting of a black teenager, a black teenager Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, which set off a national crusade against police brutality. At least 30 of the nation's largest cities had seen a year over year, had seen a year over year increase in homicides as of September 30, according to data kept by the major chiefs association. So effectively, he's saying that you, the data is anecdotal. That, that an, there, an, in effect, an, there is no data. Anecdotal means what? And what? We went through this last, what does anecdotal mean? It's based on stories that he's heard. So basically, people tell me this to be true. And so I repeat it as true. That's, that's anecdotal. That's an anecdotal. So, so but, but the story goes on to say that there have been increases in homicides, but there's, there's in fact no, n nothing that correlates it to, nothing that relates it to this shooting in Ferguson, Missouri. And so I'm going to skip down to this paragraph. It says, but many civil rights groups and criminal justice advocates have been quick to note that 2014 was a year of historically low homicide rates. They say the year-over-year -year increases do not uh, signal a crime wave. So first we start with the summary lead, okay? Then we, now we, we're talking about something that the, that the President of the United States said. So what we often do when we are writing a story that features the voice of one person is that we will use a summary lead that the president said this. And then we will use a quote. Remember we talked about using quotes? We'll use a quote to back it up. And then we follow up with a nut graph to summarize what the story is about, to get that, that tells us in a nutshell, here's what this story is about. The other thing is we tell stories in what? What order? Logical order. So the most important fact here is that the president, the president has spoken. And generally speaking, even in America, when the president speaks, that's, that's probably one of the, the biggest part of the story. And so we then sort of rank these facts below this so that we tell a story in logical order. If you, if you read the story, then you know that there's already been other stories written about this subject. So when the FBI director said this, there was a lot of publicity about it. And, and so it's sort of interesting that the president comes back and talks about it. The FBI director is white, and it's sort of, it, what his, his remarks sort of uh, angered a lot of people because they said that he was playing into the hands of, of the police officers. Lots of police officers saying, you know, we're afraid to do our jobs, uh, we're afraid for our lives, and there's, there's pretty much nothing to back up that they're, that they're in any greater danger than they ever have been. So, um, so there's now been, um, can I ask? Yeah, please. And a thing that they're really afraid of is that black people are going to videotape them acting unlawfully or misbehaving. Like that, someone saw that young woman get thrown out of her seat by the officer in the school recent, this week. Yeah. So yes. They're really afraid that the way they act now is going to get caught on tape. So, so the thing is that all of these facts, when we're writing a story, and we start to get down into the story, we have to consider all these things, because these are all things that we know, that the police are upset because people have video, ca video capabilities on their cell phones, and they're upset because people are videoing them, um, videoing them making these arrests or doing whatever they're doing. 
in the United States. And there have been some, and this, it's interesting, this woman, Kathy Lanier, was, had tried to say that police officers could confiscate the cell phones of people who were videotaping them. That is not true. It violates the Constitution of the United States. In the United States, I have every right, if, if a police officer is making an arrest, I don't have the right to interfere with the arrest. I, I, I have no right to do that. But I have a right to stand at a distance and take my phone and videotape him doing this. So police, the, the other part of this argument, which doesn't show up yet, but, it, but it, it, it's, you know, we talked about background for a story. So this is part of the background of the story, is that there is a, a real movement now for police to wear body cameras. They, they're cameras that fit onto their uniforms. And so when they, when they answer a call or they encounter, um, or, or in, encounter someone that they believe has broken the law in any, any way, they will turn these cameras on and the cameras will, will, tape their in, will videotape their, their interaction with, with the people that they are either arresting or writing a ticket to or, or questioning or whatever it happens to be. In some jurisdictions, like many people are saying, no, we want you to wear body cameras and we don't want you to be able to control when you turn it on and off. Right. Right? So the police want to be able to turn it on and off when they want to be able to turn it on and off in many, in many, many areas. The public, many people in the public are saying, no, we want you to wear the body camera and you never, you don't get to decide if it gets turned off. You put your uniform on, you turn your body camera on, and you film what you film. Yeah, so that's a debate that's going on. The police want to be able to turn them off, or some of them don't want to be able to wear them, although others feel like, well, the cameras will protect us too from people with only filming part of an encounter on a cell phone, right. the part that makes us look bad. or people who um, um, do things that aren't caught on camera that when we respond to, um, we look bad, but something happened that the person who was filming did not film. Okay, what is the, what is the purpose of a quote in a story? Why do, you, why do we use quotes in a story? What's the purpose of it? Yes, magnifying the story. It furthers the story. It, 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 it moves the story forward. So that's the purpose of a quote is to magnify the story, moves the, the story forward. So we've already, we're the storyteller here. You're the, the writer is the storyteller. And so, so, so he's, he's, he's identified his audience. Now this, post, this story appeared in the Washington Post, the newspaper in Washington, D.C. Um, and, and two writers wrote the story, one of whom is black. Um, but so they're talking about Obama. They, basically, they're covering Obama. And, and, and at some point, we'll get around to covering staged events. So, so they covered the president. They, they talked about what the president said. They used that quote to, to uh, support the lead. They came back with a good nut graph. They started to lay out the facts in logical order. And now they want to move the story forward. They want to magnify the story. And so we come back to a quote. This line about the Ferguson effect. It might be a nice political tone, but the facts just don't back it up, he said, he meaning Obama. The message seems to be, shut up complaining about the unnecessary use of force in your community, or the police will stop protecting you. So, so when you start to write your story, that, that's, that's what I've been talking about. If you, now, so you see it, how, how this writer, the, the lead, they support the lead, a nut graph, laying out the facts in logical order, and then, they, then using quotes to, to uh, magnify or further the story, and then they continue on with facts that, that further inform us, that build on this story, that tell us more about it. And then the other thing we said we do is come to a conclusion. So um, the... The chief law enforcement officer in the United States is, is called the Attorney General. And she, the, the president has a cabinet, as they do in many countries. So you know what that is, right? You know, you know what the president's cabinet is? So you, the, every president has a group of advisors. OK, in the United States, they call those people, the most senior people, um, they are called, um, are called members of the cabinet. And, and their, their offices actually have uh, a high legal status, okay? So the attorney general 
is the chief law enforcement officer for the United States of America. And, and, in this, and, and she reports directly to the president of the United States. In this case, the attorney general is a black woman named Loretta Lynch, okay? So, so we, finish, we, we, we finish our story with, with a quote from her that says, this report will serve as a critical base of knowledge as we work to defend our law enforcement, ensure our officer's safety. So she's saying, we want to make sure that our police are safe. And, and so the other thing we talked about in using, in, in, in using quotes is making sure that they are relevant to your story, that, that they fit into your story, that they make sense with your story, that they magnify your story. So that's what, that's what this quote does. Um, Lynch was scheduled to travel to Chicago on Tuesday to address the Police Chiefs Association, but had to cancel her trip because she was ill. And that's how they finish the story. This is a basic news story, so it has a fairly simple ending. One of the, the basic uh, ideas in journalism is that you, you have to do either of two things. You have to assume that your reader knows very little about what you're writing about, perhaps nothing, or that you need to refresh their memories, that they may have forgotten parts of it. And so this is background, as you say. It's background in the story. It basically reminds us, it, the writer is reminding us of what happened. A reference to last year's police shooting of black teenager Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, which set off a national crusade against police brutality. That's, that's the, the background. It reminds your readers of what, so the president is talking about the Ferguson effect. So this tells us what the president is talking about. It reminds us about this incident so that in the event we, we, we can't quite remember, you know, what, it, what is the president talking about, the Ferguson effect? This explains what it is. My view is it, it depends on how prominent um, the, the story has been and how, you know, as writers, we sort of make assumptions about what our audience already knows. And so in a story like this where Ferguson has been part of the national conversation for a, a, a long time now. So you can make an assumption that most people, you know, unless they've been hiding somewhere in a cave, most people will know something about Ferguson. And so I don't need early in the story to remind people. I do need to remind them of, of it or refresh their memories. But, but the, for me as a writer, how high up in the story I do that depends on, 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 on how well I, I believe as the storyteller that my audience is likely to remember what I'm talking about. I'm going to go through, I, I, I'm going to go through the, these others a little bit quickly. The, I'm going to, this one in particular because I, I have one that I really want to get to. So part of the, the part of the social and political debate in, in America now is about the issue of gun control. Okay, so um, the in in the last ten years or so, I don't know what your thought was. Um, uh, the proliferation of the ownership of weapons. Um. Oh, yeah. Ownership of weapons in the United States has skyrocketed since Barack Obama has become president. Yes. It, yeah. it, it started going up after September 11th happened, but it skyrocketed after President Obama <coughs> became president. And in the United States, um, we have personally, I think, a crazy relationship with guns. And... So I think the data is in the United States, 38% of white Americans own a gun and 19% of black Americans own a gun. So the gun, this, this, there's an organization in the United States called the National Rifle Association. So the National Rifle Association, this is, this is the sorts of things you need to know when you're writing a story. The National Rifle Association had a history of talking about responsible gun use and its original purpose was to tell people how to use guns and when to use guns and to basically take guns off the street. Even before that, a lot of the history, so there's long history in the United States with a conversation about gun ownership. And the rights to, uh, and the rights to own guns. It's in the Constitution. Well, and some people say this. Yeah, yeah, some people say it's in the Constitution, kind of based on our whole history of how we became a society 
different wars related to how we became a, a society. But also many people in the United States live in the country, in rural areas, and so those people um, argue that they have a right to own guns so they can hunt, right? So there are questions, so if you hunt, most of the times you'll probably hunt with a rifle, but one of the things that we find out when we go into rural areas is that a lot of people own all these automatic guns. That are um, intended for war. That are intended for war, and they own, some people own many, many of them. And they argue, well, I have a right to have this gun either because I, I hunt, but it's a gun that kills people, or um, because I'm afraid of something, and the unstated something is us. Yeah. So, so we've had a whole series in the last few years, there have been a whole series of incidents in the United States where a single person walks in and they have one of these, these automatic weapons. Basically, um, they, um, many of them are derived from a, a very popular weapon with armies back in the 70s and 80s called the AK-47. So they started making these these weapons based on that, and they have gotten more and more and more popular. And as Hillary says, the basic argument has been that, that people use guns to hunt and that sort of thing. If you shot um, a deer or something with an AK-47, you, you wouldn't be able to harvest it to eat. Okay. So, so what has happened is we've had lots of people walk into, into schools, into theaters, college campuses, and places pull out a gun and start shooting, and shoot lots of people. You know, most recently the one, we've had any number of incidents about that, and it has raised this whole conversation about whether these, these weapons that were intended for armies should be in the hands of private individuals. So the reality of who these people are demographically who are walking into these public locations with AK-47s and shooting people, almost all of them are white males. So this is one of the reasons that, that we kind of wanted to show you this story. So mo as Hillary said, and, and, and not every instance, but, but rarely, rarely do um, um, women do this. It's almost unheard of. And in, in, there have been a few instances where the shooters were, of, were of, of some race other than white, but that's rare too. They are almost to a person they are almost to a person, white men, okay? So here's, here's the way that people control the language. So, so uh, this story quotes the head of the National Rifle Association, which is a very powerful organization in the United States. So they give lots of money to members of our Congress. And in a country like the United States, if you give lots of money to a candidate, then they owe you favors in return. So the National Rifle Association has become politically very powerful, they raise lots of money, they spend lots of money in political campaigns, they donate lots of money to members of Congress, and in return, they expect those members of Congress to support their positions. So knowing that most of the people who, who go into these places, the theaters, the schools, the churches, whatever it happens to be, um, they are, are, are almost always white men then what the, one of the reasons we wanted to show you this is because of the language that people use in, 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 um, in sharing information um, across our country. And so they use what, what we call code words or buzzwords, okay? Anybody have any idea what that means? So in America, a code word is, or buzzword is, is where I say something that that conveys a meaning about somebody without actually using an offensive term, okay? So in America, we've come up, the media does this a lot too. So in, in, polit in, uh, political, in politics, in political campaign coverage, the media comes up with terms like soccer mom, okay? In America, football, what you think of as football is soccer in America, okay? So they talk about soccer moms. So a soccer mom, is, young, is a young white female with young children who lives in the suburbs. And takes her children to soccer practice, to soccer practice. every day. Kinda. Okay. So there are all these kind of terms. So inner city, the term inner city in the United States. Now, New York is a city, 
And if you live on Central Park in New York City in an apartment that costs $10 million, that's inner city. But in, 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 in the way that the language is used, inner city tends to mean um, slums in, in big cities. That's, what it, that's, that, that's the, the intended meaning of it. And they can say that without saying uh, slums populated by minorities within the, inner, with, within the big cities. Or urban. Urban, yes. That's that word too. often means black people. That's their way, oftentimes their way of saying black people without saying black people. Yeah, urban. So, uh, which is interesting because not all black people live in cities either. Yeah. So, here's the lead to this story. Americans' appetite for more gun control has increased slightly over the past two years. So this is an interesting fact. And, and it's the reason that this, that this writer is leading with this. Because you cannot get gun control laws passed in the United States, and Americans are increasingly in favor of it, except you can't get the best. Americans' appetite for more gun control has increased slightly over the past two years, according to poll results released Tuesday. And the National Rifle Association launched a campaign calling for the federal government to better enforce existing regulations and put, as the NRA chief put, um, it's put it, Thugs and gangbangers in prison. Thug, and that, those are the two words I want to call your attention to. Thugs and gangbangers. The person who, a gangbanger in the United States is a person who's a member of a, a street gang. You know, committing acts of violence or, or committing crimes, things like that. But in this connotation, gangbanger has a particular meaning. In the United States of America, when you use the term gangbanger, it is almost always, almost always a reference to a black or Latino person, almost always. The same is true with this, this whole thugs is usually, a, now gangbangers usually refers to black and Latino men, young black and Latino men. Thugs tends to refer primarily to black men. So, if, so for white people who are reading this story, it, it, they can say this, so they didn't use any racial slurs, okay? But, so, but he can say this, and, and in, the, in, the, in the minds of the people that he is trying to communicate to, conjure up a particular image, okay? So, so what you've been talking about doing is changing the narrative about Africa. So it's not always, the language is not always uh, very direct. It's, you know, we call it overt. It's not very direct sometimes. It's not, it's, it's not the offensive language that people will use, but they will use these, these terms like this that have come to, that, that, that sound softer and that don't sound offensive, but that conjures up a particular image in the minds of the people that they're trying to communicate with. So for, for white people who are buying all these guns that Hillary talked about and who have bought more guns since Obama became president, they're saying, we have to protect ourselves from thugs and gangbangers, meaning black and Latino men. And notice the thugs is a, the gangbangers is a reference to, to black and Latino men, but the thugs is a specific reference to black men. So, so we get mentioned twice, we're so special. So that's the kind of image you're trying to conjure up. And, and, and one of the things that, that that uh, Western journalists have a tendency to do sometimes is pick up terms like these and use them in their stories. Yeah. And, and can I say something? Yes. So he's using these words and the journalists are repeating these words because they know there it would be outrageous and there would be an uproar from black and Latino people if the quote said, the NRA's chief put it, put, put black people and Latino people in prison. Yeah. People, black people and Latino people and some white people and other people would lose their minds if he said, let's put more black and Latino people in prison, right? But he can say, let's put more thugs and gangbangers in prison. Everybody knows what he's talking about. He picked those words intentionally. And the journalist is not culturally sensitive or has his own bias where he thinks that black people and Latinos need to be incarcerated. The journalist doesn't challenge it. The, the journalist might continue to use that language. In, in this instance, in this instance, the journalist is quoting, quoting the man who said it, which I think is the right thing to do. Um, I probably would have done this myself, 
although uh, because it, there, there are two ways, I think, of looking at this. One is he's picking up the language, but the other thing is, is that in, in, the way I see it is he's pointing out that this man used these veiled racist terms. That's kind of how I see it. I actually would have done a lead somewhat similar to this. The reason being that, that um, when you're telling a story, you sort of want to convey the attitudes of the people that you're talking about, right? So you can't, so if I'm the writer, I can't say that, I can't, I can't paraphrase it to say that the head of the National Rifle Association used racially charged, well, I could say that. Could you it? could. Yeah, I could say that, that he used racially charged words. But I too might have used, I, I would have used those words too. Yeah, I, yeah. I would have used those words. Yeah. Because, because as, for me as a storyteller, you know, even though I know that they will conjure up a particular image in the minds of the people that he's trying to reach, it will tell other people that he's using these, these inflammatory, offensive terms. And, and they're not so offensive that we don't publish them. But there are some newspapers and some journalists who might be less professional who would not, so there's a phrase right before the end of the sentence, and so he says, calling for the federal government to better enforce existing regulations and put, and here's the phrase, as the NRA's chief calls it, thugs, thugs and gangbangers in prison. Some writer, a less um, professional writer, might have put federal government to better enforce existing regulations and put thugs and gangbangers in prison. And, and this guy, yeah, this guy is calling out the fact. Yeah. He's pointing attention to the fact. This guy who ran the NRA called y'all thugs and gangbangers. He's calling out that the NRA chief used that language. And that's a really subtle difference, and it's one of the ways that you as a storyteller can do that. And, and he does it by adding, what, uh, five six, words? Six words. Yeah. Yeah. As the NRA chief put it, he's saying, I didn't say this, but I want you to know that he said it. So it's a device that, that basically, so, so a lot, if you left those words out, then, then I would agree with you. But, but, and a lot of journalists would. A lot of white journalists would think nothing of it. They said, well, he said it, I didn't say it. But, but, but he goes the extra step of saying the NRA chief put it this way. So this journalist, it suggests that this journalist is at least has some level of racial sensitivity or, or racial awareness to um, call out the NRA chief rather than just repeating it um, without pointing at him for using that language. Okay, so this story is a, is a feature story, and I just kind of wanted to show it to you. We wanted to show it to you, uh, in part because um, it, 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 it is a feature, but it's also a feature about a black woman. And, and here's the thing, so, so um, we, we don't often see stories, and it, this is the kind of story that you can write, okay? So we don't often see stories about the achievements of people who look like us. And so for me, it's always important to not write stories about black people being poor, black people being hungry, and, and looking, black people looking for handouts, black people committing crimes, <coughs> like, you know, whatever. Black people um, in, embroiled in debates over public policy, black people demanding respect, black, you know, whatever it happens to be. Every now and then, I want to write a story that says black people achieve. That, that we're not, you know, if I want to write some stories that says, here's who we really, here's a representation that we don't often see of ourselves. And for me, my audience for a story like this is two. two, two people. One, it's black people, because black people need to see other black people achieve. And two, it's for white people to say, you know, the, 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 that sister that you followed around the store last week, you know, because you thought she was going to, to, to to shoplift uh, the, the perfume, this is who she is. You know, because because that, that's the sort of thing that happens. So uh, she is the first African-American woman to receive a PhD in astrophysics from Yale. And astrophysics is the, the study basically of, 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 of the stars and how they interact with each other and, and how, sort of how the universe is formed and interacts on, on a daily basis. So that's, uh, that's her field. And, and Yale is? Yale is one of the most prominent universities in the United States. They, the United States has a group of universities called Ivy League schools, and they are the, the, they're generally recognized 
along with a, a, a few others, are generally recognized as the best and the most prominent schools in the United States, and Yale is one of those schools. So it's a, re it's a really, uh, really uh, uh, important institution of higher learning. Now, so we talked about writing features, and, and I talked with you about starting features with an anecdotal lead, right? Okay. Actually, the anecdote is the second one. <laughs> so I like this device because it's simple, it's very straightforward, and, and it's, a, it's a good device for telling a story about a human being, okay, about a person. And, and this story is strictly about this one woman. Meet Jedediah is Jedediah, Jedediah, it's not Jedediah, Jadida. yeah, thank you. Meet, meet Jadida is She's the first African-American woman to receive a PhD in astrophysics <coughs> from Yale. This is a summary lead, okay? But it, it tells you what the story is about. And now, if, if, you, if you are a black person, certainly a black person in America, then it's going to draw me into the story because I, I'm interested in the fact, and I actually was interested in the story, because it was a black woman who got a PhD in astrophysics from Yale. They're one of the most famous astrophysicists in the United States right now is a black man. You know, and he's all over television and he's gotten to be famous, which is interesting. But, uh, but, but, but here's a black woman who's doing this. So then they, they use this straightforward lead, this straightforward summary lead, and then they come down and follow up with an antidote. As a child, Israel was fascinated by the night sky. That, that's, that's a nice detail. It, it, it's, it's, she, they, we've told us, you know, what prompted her to become, to go into this field. Now, at the age of 33, tells us how old she is, she's one of three students to be accepted in, into the Fisk Vanderbilt Bridge Program, a program that works to improve diversity in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Then a quote from her. She gets to speak, you know, you, we're, the, we're the storytellers, but it's her story. So we've told people, we've introduced her, people to her, we've told them something about her, and now she gets to speak. Neither my undergraduate school, Norfolk State University in Virginia, nor the school where I got my first master's degree, Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, offered astronomy majors. The closest I could get was physics, which served me well, since I needed to know physics in order to successfully navigate astronomy anyway. It's was said in a news release. So then they tell, so this last little phrase said in a news release, it tells you where they got the information. So we, so if, if they had sat down with her to talk to her, you might say, she said in an interview. Or, or if you talk to her over the phone, you might say, she said in a phone interview. Or if she said this at a news conference, she said in a news conference. But you're telling your readers where you got this information from. Okay? And then it goes on to sort of, you, you know, to, then sort of, you see how now we go, go back. In 2014, Isla completed her award-winning study that examines the physics of particle jets emanating from black holes. So we start this sort of chronological thing here. We go back a, couple, uh, a year, and, and we, 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 sort of, we sort of use that device. Remember the, the cocktail glass? So that's what they're doing here. So we have a very straightforward lead that, that inverted pyramid, we have a summary lead, we, we have an antidote that tells us who she is, you know, we, we, uh, we, we give her an opportunity to speak in her story, and then we start to lay out the chronology about her. See, I, I like the way they finish the story. You know, a cocktail glass has, a, has the base that finishes the story out. Isler uses huge telescopes, including the Fermi Space Telescope, to examine how black holes work. It's, it's very simple, very clean. It tells us what she does. So it, it, not, it doesn't simply, just, the, the story just doesn't come to an abrupt end. They actually tell us what it is that she does. And that, that forms that. So, so we've got a summary lead, an antidote. We allow her to speak, and we create our little inverted pyramid there. We then lay out our story in, in and, and create a chronology, and then we come down here and we finish our story off with a very simple, very clean ending.